hey, this is Stefan Kinsella. I, I'm talking to you from Houston, Texas, where I live. I'm a, a patent attorney by profession and um, a libertarian writer and speaker. And I've been a libertarian since high school and uh, from Louisiana originally. And uh, I would consider myself to be the type of libertarian, um, an anarchist libertarian, influenced heavily by uh, the Austrian School of Economics and Murray Rothbard and other thinkers such as Ayn Rand, who was not an anarchist, and Mises and Hans Hermann Hoppe and, and many others. So that's basically where I'm coming from um, in my life and approach to political philosophy. So how did you become a libertarian? Uh, what would that have been? What year would that have been? Probably 82 when I was uh, like or 81 or 82 when I was a, a sophomore or a, ju a, a junior in high school. And uh, I was sort of apolitical, didn't know anything about it, was just interested in science and philosophy and all that stuff. And uh, a, a librarian recommended that I read The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. So I read it and that got me down the Ayn Rand path at first. Um, but then that finally led to Austrian economics and anarcho-capitalism. So that was pretty early on. Um, did you... So that would have been before. I know a lot of people recently have been brought into it by Ron Paul or had their attention drawn to it by other sources. No, no, I was way before Ron Paul. Um, I've always liked Ron Paul, but I've never l really learned anything from him. I think he's just uh, someone who's, who has adhered to certain ideas. Um, I was at I went to Louisiana State University, LSU, and I was there from 80, 83 to uh, 80. Um, like uh, to 1991, eight years. And when I was there, Ron Paul actually ran for president in, I think, 88 it was. And I was a, a libertarian, but I was still skeptical of liberty. I was, I was Randian. I was, you know, so I was, their politics is libertarian, but they, she hated libertarians. So I thought she was right in condemning them. I thought there was something wrong with them, right? That they were not identical to us but i kept seeing their pamphlets around school and listening to and everything they said sounded similar to ayn rand's politics uh and what so did ayn when ron, rand hate about libertarians well i think it was it was number one it was competition <laughs> and number two um they didn't buy her whole philosophy they was just like her political the wing the political aspect of her philosophy so she has an ethics and a metaphysics and an epistemology and a moral theory and, a, and an aesthetic theory and they just took the politics part, right? And she thought it had to be an integrated whole, and she also thought they plagiarized her and ripped her off, um, which is ridiculous if you're a thinker and you want to influence people to adopt your ideas, and when they do, then you attack them for it. It's strange. Um, and plus, a lot of them were um, were anarchists, and she hated anarchists. Do you think they took her, I guess, her philosophy too far or her, her ideas too far? So she had a long – I mean they, they still reject libertarianism. Um, but I think that's basically the reasons. But I, I thought she was right at first until I kept seeing, you know, <laughs> evidence to the contrary. Yeah, that is interesting. I have heard I did hear Walter Block say something similar about if you would disagree with her with something, she would basically kick you out and wouldn't have anything to do with you anymore. Would cut off all contact, so to speak. Yeah, you had to buy her whole philosophy. Um, and that she thinks so. She thinks libertarians have no. I mean, it's almost like the the the, the thick or li or religious uh, perspective on liberty, where you anchor your um, your political views in a broader philosophy. You know, um, of the whole, that, that encompasses like a worldview or everything. Yeah. So, like the, like some some religious people would say, you can't really have a solid political philosophy or ethics if it's not grounded in a deeper moral law, that kind of thing. And Rand had a similar view, but it was more secular. You know, um, so she thought the foundations were shaky and that they were arbitrary. Like if you just happen to like liberty for no articulable reason, then you weren't really a, a reliable ally and all that. Um, so it was sort of that kind of view. So how did you go from there to being more libertarian and then into the anarchy side of things? What were some were there certain well, people you encountered or arguments that clinched it for you? Well, I guess you know I bought into her. You know, she has I think. The two fundamental flaws that she made were on intellectual property because she bases her whole philosophy of property rights on this idea that 
things you create of value are things you have property rights in. And that works to a degree when you talk about land and other resources, but things it you also can hold in your hand. Yeah, but but then she thought it meant well if you create a, an idea like then you also own that. So that was the root of her whole philosophy, and I think that's wrong as we we can get into. Um, and then her other is you know the idea that you need li you, the government is usually bad if it's too big, but you need limited government um, because without without government there's anarchy and anarchy um, anarchy is necessarily law lawlessness because uh, you could have competing governments basically or agencies that could have wars with each other but of course she herself did not favor one world government which she rash she logically should have following her own reasoning right because we have 200 governments nation state governments in the world today and unless you have one supreme government overall to ensure uniformity of laws and to ensure that they don't fight each other then we still have anarchy with respect to each other so logically, the objectivists should want there to be a one world state, and some of them admit that, that ideally that is the ideal solution, but that in today's world it would be too, uh, it would be too problematic. Um, so they sort of hedged their bets on that. Yeah, what's that meme that's going around where it, you know we can't have anarchy, wouldn't warlords take over? And then it has a picture of uh, different United States presidents and Vladimir Putin and all these different people. Yeah, yeah. So they've already um, taken over. Right. I would say they, it was it was the, it was the, I think there was uh, probably the key book that made me start thinking hard about it was uh, the Tannehills. Morris and Linda Tannehill wrote a classic book in the seventies, I think, called The Market for Liberty, um, which is uh, lays out extends sort of the Randian minarchist views to to an anarchist. Um, of course, Rothbard and David Friedman, people like that. But it was really the Tannehills, I think, that that made me finally admit that you just can't. Once you believe in individual rights like Rand did um, and that it's always wrong to initiate force against people, then you have to say, well, you can't tax them, and you can't, you can't use force against them to prevent them from using their own security providers as long as they're not committing aggression, and that's what the government has to do. The state has to do one of those two things to exist. It has to either tax or it has to outlaw competition. And both of those actions require the use of force against innocent people who have not committed aggression, which is what's prohibited by the non-aggression principle that's key to Ayn Rand's political philosophy and libertarianism. So it's just by logic. Uh, the state is inherently criminal or aggressive, and it, it, therefore it's unjust. That's the basic argument for anarchy. So did you become a patent attorney while you were still Randian? Uh, it seems very interesting that a patent attorney would, would write a book on against electro, intellectual property. I don't know if um, you can elaborate on that. In a way, it's a coincidence because um, the one thing in like uh, in, 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 in college and in, in law school that always bothered me was Ayn Rand's argument for patent and copyright because it's unlike her other arguments. She, she comes up with this artificial argument for why it makes sense to have these – so-called natural property rights that expire after a certain finite time, like copyrights expire after roughly 100 or so years and patents expire after about 17 years, whereas other property rights never expire. So if they're a natural property right, why do they expire, and why was Ayn Rand in favor of that? And the argument just seemed arbitrary, and also the number of years seemed arbitrary. What's the right number of years? Why would it why not just 16 years instead of 17 or at least or with whatever. property taxes it's dependent on your ability to continue paying yeah exactly there's some articulable pr principle but for patents there's no there's no principle whatsoever it's just totally arbitrary and that didn't seem right so i always thought that there was some better argument for patent and copyright like i assumed they were intellectual property because it's called that and i assumed it's part of capitalism and the free market because it's in the us constitution which is i think what what I think that's why Ayn Rand believed in it because she moved here from Russia and she worshipped the U.S. because it was so much better than Russia in communism. So she assumed that everything in the Constitution was basically capitalist, right? But I think she was just wrong. So she came up with a sort of tortured argument trying to justify it, but she never succeeded. Um, so I always thought there was something wrong with the argument, um, and I started writing more and more on libertarian theory myself, like on rights theory and then later on different… Different things, some legal theory, um, 
And in my law practice, I first did oil and gas law, but then I, I decided to switch to patent law around, around 1993 or 94. And at the same time, I started turning my attention towards trying to come up with an argument, a better argument than Ayn Rand and others had given for patent law and copyright law. Um, and since I knew more and more about the law itself, since I was practicing, I started reading, you know, all my reading on the area helped me study it. But finally, I, I gave up. I gave up trying to prove it because I realized I was failing because I was doing trying to do the impossible. I was trying to justify something that's unjustifiable. So, as part of my attempt to justify it, I realized uh, that it's unjustifiable and that it's it's totally contrary to property rights and to the free market and capitalism. So is that the topic that you find you get the most resonance with? I, I know that's most of your talks, at least at Mises U. Or on intellectual property. Um, yeah, it, it means is you know in the beginning days I started going right after Roth, I met Rothbard once in October uh, November of ninety four right before he died in two months later, and uh, then I started attending the Austrian scholars conferences and I would give talks on a variety of topics um, rights theory contract theory causation legislation. Um, and then intellectual property. So it was just like one subset of what I would speak on, and it wasn't my main interest, and it's still not really. Um, but because I'm sort of one of the few people who really understands the law and Austrian economics and libertarian theory. Um, You're more of kind a, of writing, much more of an authority on it. There's just no, hardly anyone else, and so I, I wrote on it because I thought I had to kind of get out of my system and set, put the issue to bed, and then I was going to move on to other things, and I have. But yeah, most people know me for that because that idea kind of arose at the right time. Well, uh, it's really the other way around. I mean, one reason I turned my attention to it in part, my own personal timing in my life, like practicing law and becoming a, a budding libertarian scholar, but also that was around, right around the time, you know, 94, 95, that's when the internet basically started. And at that point in time, all the problems caused by copyright and patent in the previous centuries were mostly unseen by the average person they they were they were always there and they plagued businesses and they they slowed down innovation and they distorted free speech but it wasn't so obvious until the digital revolution and the internet right when then you started having piracy and then you started having copyright crackdowns so that's when libertarians started having sort of a um a cognitive dissonance because most of them were in favor of IP, but they saw it being so-called abused by copyright holders and by the state and restricting internet freedom. And so people now it's started, affecting your daily person's life. So people started turning ways. their yeah. So they started turning their attention to it and trying to wonder about it. Like, is it really a good idea? And then the people that were defending it started doubling down their defenses and being on the rear guard, like being putting put on the defensive and um and so in the middle of all this, I kind of came up with like – we'll say definitive, but like an authoritative uh, approach grounded in solid libertarian principles, but also um, with, with total awareness of the way the law works. So um, like a lot, of, a lot of people that write on, on IP are like political philosophers or philosophers or economists, and they don't really – understand the actual patent and copyright law itself like they have a general understanding but it's so arcane that you know i'll read it and i cringe sometimes because they they'll confuse trademark and copyright or patent and trademark or trade secret in this or they'll they'll confuse plagiarism with copyright or they'll call it fraud or contract breach they just get all these things all tangled up so you have to kind of go back to basics in your libertarian and economics to kind of to, re, to revisit like why do we believe in rights and what are rights, what are property rights, and how does economics interrelate to it? You have to kind of sort those things out in a more clear fashion to kind of solve the IP puzzle. So the IP puzzle is pretty easy once you see everything in a clear way, but you have to first see everything in a clear way to you know to get there. Right. Well, and it seemed I was watching a, a I guess it was a mini documentary about the invention of the of the screw. And like Phillips versus the flathead and uh, mm -hmm. Alan Keyes and all that stuff. The guy that invented the Phillips, he had a patent on it. And the only reason it's so ubiquitous is I think it was either a car manufacturer. It was Henry Ford or somebody like that offered to buy him out of the patent and all these things. And it was like the only reason that that took off is because 
that it, it, it became standardized was because somebody bought the patent for it, but then a whole bunch of people started infringing on it and just adopting it faster than anybody could catch her. Something like that. And so well, it was and like- Eventually it would expire eventually anyway, but it, but if it takes 17 years, it could slow things down. I mean, right. you know, like the US in World War One, when it started our airplane industry, even though the airplane really started here um, in the US, uh, our industry had been slowed down and plagued by patent wars between people claiming various patents on it. So when World War One started, we were really underdeveloped in the air, airplane industry. So I think we had to, uh, all the countries had to go to France and things like that. So, you know, it retarded the development of the airline industry. Um, there's lots of we're so used to these systems that we take it for granted, like the copyright system. We take it for granted that you can't sing happy birthday in a restaurant without permission. Alcohol that finally stuff. expired. But yeah, <laughs> well, no, it didn't expire. But there, a, 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 there was a lawsuit that finally showed that it was public domain all along. But of course, for 40 years or something, someone had been collecting millions of dollars of royalties from everyone. And it's too late to get that back. You know, so it did its damage. But the point is, patent and copyright heavily distort of uh, culture and uh, um, and industry and we don't even notice it um, um so it leads to artificial like all kinds of artificial things that we take for granted now like for example um like all, all the laser printers you buy they're not compatible with each other which is kind of stupid right because most things you want to make them compatible so that you can have competition and consumers prefer compatibility but they all have these patents on the circuits they they just make these circuits like a mating circuit they make so like half the circuit is in the printer and half's in the cartridge so they have to each have the circuit to work so that if anyone makes a, a, a generic cartridge they have to put that circuit in there and that's infringing on a patent on the circuit which is useless but it's just i mean all kinds of things like that right so um, yeah people people frown on things like i know uh in the camera world sony has their own proprietary uh memory card called a memory stick and it only works in sony things because sony's trying to get adoption because they're the only people that make that style of memory card and they don't license it to anybody but in the technology world because things move so fast and there's so many different ways to make a memory card you know it's the ones that have basically become open source and most widely used that become adopted not you know sd cards are are definitely the standard and it's because they they tried to work and be compatible with everything that was interesting to watch i remember i had the uh, sony uh i think they call it magic magic stick or something like that and it was a little mp3 type system but it was heavily copy protected i, I think you had to have the cd in your computer to play a song i mean it was so ridiculous you know and then apple came out and they and steve jobs i think made these deals with itunes and the music industry to, to start having just mp3 files which are um which are have no drm right and um so that changed the industry and sony lost out when they, remember they used to be the leaders with walkmans and they could have had this digital walkman but they insisted on copy protection probably to satisfy the content providers it really i can't even blame them but you can see how all these things lead to distortion um, I mean, you have people self-censoring all the time. Like when you post a YouTube video, you got to be careful not to sing a song or have it in the background because you'll get struck down um, because of the because of the because of the, the digital millennium copyright system, which forces YouTube to do that to avoid liability under copyright law. So our entire society is heavily distorted because of all this. And I have heard, and you can correct me if this is wrong, I have heard that there were more music sales when things like Napster and other different uh, pirating so-called uh, avenues started to come up. With the increase of, pir of music piracy and copyright piracy, the sales will actually go up because now people are being introduced to more things and then they decide to buy the full quality copy or a CD or an album. Is that true? Do you know anything about that? I think there's something to that, at least in certain phases of, of where we are in the cycle. Um, I think it's true with books too. Like um, there's so many, there's so much creative work now in the world, which is another argument against copyright. They say it's necessary for creativity. And yet copyright law is largely unenforceable now because of encryption and torrenting and the internet and digital stuff. So basically copyright is, is a dead letter now for most people. And yet there's still an outpouring of creative music. So the danger most creators, artists or novelists or whatever, um, or, or musicians, 
the danger they face is obscurity, right? So they want to get their notice so they can sell tickets to their movies or to their to their concerts or or whatever. Um, I I do think that there was a that that the age of sales it may be over, but it's not because of copyright or piracy. It's just because technology permits streaming now, and people just prefer streaming. Um, and the royalties on streaming are a lot lower, uh, partly because piracy is out there. But um, you know, but also just they have people have so many options of different artists with all unique songs. But well, now if you, remember, you only have so much time in the day to listen to different artists. Well, yeah, if you remember, uh, yeah. So now curation is the service people really want. They want someone mm-hmm. to just pick it for them. Um, um, uh, and, and there was a, a, a brief period of time where people that sold vinyl records could make a lot of money, and then for a while it was audio tapes and things like that. And then it was CD. The CD generation, what, maybe 30 years it lasted. You had people like Madonna and people like that making tens of millions of dollars. And those days are pretty much gone except for those hyper, hyper superstars. And even they don't sell. And, and then you had people ripping. Th- Remember, people used to rip things and they would have these little, they would trade these thumb drives or these hard drives full of music and movies too. No one, I don't think many people do that anymore. Maybe in the third world they do, but it's just too much. To, there's too much stuff coming out. Your, your little collection is going to be outdated. You don't have to manage that. So then people started buying music from iTunes, but they didn't really buy it. They just had a license. And now they don't even do that anymore. They just, they just have, a, they just can stream, you know, which is the nicest um, solution. Um, but it, those do make it harder to make money using the old business models, but that's just because technology has made the industry change. And when the industry changes, you have to adapt your business models to make money. You know, just like when the when the automobile came about, it put the buggy whip manufacturers out of business and the candle makers suffered when the light bulb came about. Um, things change when technology and business models change. Yeah, I don't hear anybody uh, bemoaning the loss of the blubber industry and whaling. Right. Well, and it's the same sort of thing with uh, the film industry with copyright. You originally just had, it would it was a theatrical release. There was no home video. There was no television. There was nothing. It was just a film. And so that's where you made money on making a film and showing a film and then some of right. the concessions. And now there's basically no money in any of that anymore, uh, except for some of the huge blockbusters. And now, like you said, it's in curation. So you've got Netflix and all these different services, which tell it what movies you like and it will try to guess what other movies that you would like to watch just because there's so much to go through you don't have time well, to. the way i think about it i think covid covid of course distorted everything uh, but in non-covid times I, I still think going to the movie theater is going to be popular so if you think about it yeah in the old days big blockbusters and movies uh on large scales given you know taking inflation into account they were possible based purely on ticket sales at the box office right and, and then after that, there all these secondary and tertiary income streams got added on, like going to cable, like HBO, and then movie uh, hotel rooms, and then airplanes, and then rebroadcasting on television networks later, and then later video t- video sales, video rentals, and video sales on VHS tapes. And by the way, that was almost killed by a Supreme Court decision, a so- the Sony case in the '80s, I believe it was, where there was a, a question about whether. Um, when consumers use their own video recorders, their VHS recorders, to record like a television show that was broadcast on the airwaves, whether they were violating copyright, okay? And that case was decided five to four. So by one vote, the the, the whole video taping industry was rescued. It could have been lost because of copyright, and the movie industry, of course, fought it. But of course, they were benefited from it because it opened up this whole you know blockbuster rentals and all this. And they would sell movies on video, and then DVDs later and Blu-rays and all that. So it it basically helped them. So quite often they fight things that would help them, um, but that's just that's the way it goes with entrenched interests and people with no, they have no incentive to be creative in their thinking because they can rest on their mono, their easy monopoly to make to rake money in it. They don't want to have to adapt. Um, they want, in another sense, they want to have their cake and eat it too. If if they if copyright really existed and they were so concerned with people stealing things from them, why wouldn't why would they ever sell things on home video? Why not just go to the just do theater, and where you can monitor and make sure that people aren't recording and making secondhand copies? Yeah. Because they if, want the if, secondary because they want, income streams. Yeah. They want the extra income streams, but they don't want the benefits that people get 
So it's like, you, you know, pick one. Well, and this is the, this is the kind of the principled, simple argument against IP. It's that um, there's a distinction, and this is what people have a hard time wrapping their heads around this because they're used to the idea of this. And, um, but this is where I bring hum Austrian economics into it. To it but you know there's a simple concept it sounds complicated because the word is praxeology it's this kind of crazy latin term or greek term that mises came up with it just means the logic of human action it just means how we analyze what it means for us to do things in the world to act and and it's a simple thing that we human beings see the future coming we we have an idea of what it is and we don't like something about it so we want to change it so we look around us in the world and we use some tools or means to change things, right? So all human action is always an attempt to achieve some different state of the world in the future by interfering in the course of events. That's what human action is. So it's the use of a means or a scarce resource or a tool. It's the use of something, your body or the dirt or you know, to affect a, a future outcome. And and but it's guided by knowledge. So you can't do anything if you don't know anything. You have to know something about the way cause and effect work. You have to know that to catch a fish, I can put a line in the water with a hook on it and I can cook it over a fire and eat it and it will give me nourishment. You have to know these things and you have to have the availability. You have to have arms that work and you have to have a tool. You have to have a string and a, and a rod, you know, and you have a fish and a stream nearby. You have to have these. So you have to have knowledge to guide your action and the action has to use scarce means. So both these things are critical to any human action and the, the, the things that we use they're the type of things people can have a fight over or conflict uh, because only one person can use this fish at a time or this or this or this fishing pole at a time or my body. So we have property rights to specify who gets to use these things. That's the whole point of property rights is to solve conflicts among things that you can have a conflict over. But it does not apply to knowledge because knowledge can be spread freely. Like when someone learns a, a better way to plant crops or a better way to build a house, like using log cabins, logs instead of uh, mud or maybe you know Strong. building a log building a log house instead of living in a cave when people learn or, or using fire to cook things or putting animal skin on you for clothing or using a wheel on a cart to help it roll instead of dragging it you know when people come up with these ways of doing things that makes their action more efficient other people learn that's how society progresses so the body of knowledge that we can use dip into to 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 decide what to do in the world always expands. This is why we're richer than past generations because the body of knowledge keeps getting bigger and bigger. But property rights never apply to knowledge because it's not a scarce thing. You can't have conflict over it. Like you and I can't use the same tractor at the same time. But we so can both rely on it. two plus but two we, equals four at the same time. Yeah, and we can both use the same tilling method or the same farm planting technique or the same way of rationing fertilizer on the crops. We can all do the same, or we can all use the same recipe to bake a cake in our own homes using our own ingredients and in our own bowls and our own ovens, but but we can't use the same old bowls and, and ovens. So property rights apply to one, but not the other. It's very simple. Um, and it's actually to, a healthy thing when people start to copy each other. Uh, I was talking it's very good. Yeah. who was in trailer yeah. manufacturing and all the trailer manufacturers buy each other's trailers and they copy what works and it's yeah. just all freely exchanged information there's no patents on how to weld things together it's of course the best and, way to do it and we all benefit from it and that's why that's how society advances and that's how technology advances um that's what learning is really and and that's what free market competition is by the way when you see someone who comes up with a new business idea that succeeds what it means to succeed is they make a lot of money they make a lot of money by selling a lot of services or products to consumers by satisfying the consumers they saw a demand that no one was meeting and they satisfied it with a new idea. But when you do that, you make a profit, which is a very high profit at first because you don't have any competition. So other so people notice So that's what spurs this. innovation. Of course, and it's, it spurs competition on the free market. So people see someone making a profit, you know, delivering pizza, right? Oh, this guy, you don't have to go to the pizza store. You can, you can have home delivery. So I don't know who was the first one who started it, Domino's or Pizza Hut or whoever. Uh, or fast food, you know, someone's making fast food hamburgers. So now you have Burger King and Wendy's competing with McDonald's, and and you have, you know, Papa John's and Pizza Inn all competing with Pizza Hut or whatever. However it works, you know. Um, so 
And when you have competitors start doing what you're doing, they steal some of your customers, but you don't really own your customers. That's just a word we use. But And it reduces your profits because now you have competition, and that makes everyone better off except for the first guy who has to keep innovating and pleasing the consumers. That's why the free market works. So um, the patent and copyright system basically – Give, give someone who comes up with an idea first, they give him a mon monopoly over it. So what, where, what I was going to get with, you, with your analogy is the, the simple idea of against IP is that um, if you want the benefits of giving information out to the public, then one of the costs of that is that you're giving information out to the public. So if you have a secret technique for making candles better, you can do that in your own factory, and you maybe can make them at a better price because you have this better technique. And if you keep it secret, you can use that forever. That's called a trade secret. But if you sell a product where the there's an improved design and it's going to become apparent to people, but you have to tell the secret to sell it. Like if you have a better mousetrap, you're going to tell people, hey, buy my mousetrap because it's better because it has these features. Mm -hmm. So you're going to publicize the improvement that you came up with. But, but you have to publicize it to sell them, right. but that means you're going to tell people how to do it, and soon you're going to draw competition. That's just the balance that is faced by any entrepreneur. You have to know that you're going, if you succeed, you're going to face competition. People are going to emulate what you do in better or worse ways or similar ways, and you're going to have to come up with a business model that lets you make a profit even though you're facing competition. And then there's the thing also is, the, the KFC way of doing things where you have a secret recipe and that's what you sell people on and you don't have to tell them what's in it. And if they knew the secret recipe, they could make chicken just like KFC does, but they've just decided never to sell that. Yeah, and and the same thing with Coca-Cola. Although people say that the secret the secret's really out there and it's you know, even if you knew exactly Coca-Cola's formula, you know, it's going to be hard to replicate it with a big factory and to compete with their name and all this. So it's not so easy to just jump in and compete with people. I mean the pharmaceutical industry says that they spend so much money, billions of dollars developing a drug, so they need a monopoly on it for 17 years with a patent to stop competition so they can sell it at a monopoly price to recoup their cost of investment. Right? That's the argument. But first of all… <laughs> The cost of development is so high because of the FDA. Like, so the government imposes all these regulations that you have to jump through to sell a drug on the market, and that makes the cost really high. And then they complain about the cost, and so the government they gives have to them rely a, on copyright. <laughs> so then the government gives them a patent. Like, so the government, the government FDA system requires the government to come up with a patent system. So why don't we just get rid of both and just let the free market operate? Um, you know, in the first place. An interesting related part to that, and I'm not sure, it's probably not any different, but um, the way that people will put research into the like the genetics of apple trees, because apples are so heterozygous. If you plant a seed from a gala apple tree, it won't, the apples won't be anything like a gala apple. And so what they've done, every tree that produces gala apples or red delicious or whatever your favorite kind is, for example, those are all literally the same living organism that they've cut and like re replanted. Right. And so they can say that, Oh, the reason that you can't um, take one of our plants and start making your own selling your own apples from it is because we developed, we did all the genetic research to put that. Now that actually has some merit to it because now you're talking about somebody who bred a certain type of tree and they're not willing to sell any part of that tree to somebody else. So the only way you got it was if you stole it from them. Now we're talking about a physical item. Yeah, except, uh, except they often do get patents on it and in the patent they have to reveal how they did it. Um, so mm. theoretically someone could read it and duplicate their effort um, after at least the patent is expired. Um, but what, what typically happens in those cases, you have a, um, a patent on, um, on the seeds or even on, uh, 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 on the genetically modified seed or something like that. And so you'll have one farmer buys these expensive seeds. They're expensive because there's a monopoly price on them because only the original guy can sell the seeds, plant his crops with it, and then the wind will carry some of them to a neighbor's crop so then they start growing on this guy's crop now 
And so then the Monsanto or whoever, they'll bust in with the government, and they'll raid his farm, and they'll take his crops from him because he's growing patented crops. Is this, Even though, is this true? Is this really happening? Oh, yeah. Yeah, I can send you some links. This is it's insane. <laughs> And everyone says, oh, so if, if, if you point this stuff out to a defender of patents, they'll either say, well, you're exaggerating, which I'm not. I can send you some links. Or they'll say, well, that's an anomaly, which it's not. Or they'll say that, well, that's just an abuse of the system, and we don't support that. And, of course, this happens all the time. I can, I can, I can just – there's thousands and thousands of obvious – I, would, I wouldn't call them an abuse because they're all using the law as the law is intended. I would call them um, um, examples of, of outrageous consequences, right? But the law – they're outrageous and obviously unjust consequences because the law itself is unjust and unnatural. When you have an unnatural, unjust law, you're going to have unnatural consequences. So for example, if you oppose the welfare system because it tends to steal – well, it steals money from people that earned it, so it's theft. And it also encourages bad habits in the people that you're subsidizing, right? But now we start criticizing people that, that take welfare because they're lazy or whatever. Well, they're not really lazy. They're responding to natural incentives. If you pay someone for nothing, if you, put a nothing. if you put a trough out with free food, the pigs are going to come eat at the trough. I mean you can't put a trough with free food out and complain that the pigs come to eat at it. I mean that's, that's the goal of – That's the what, goal of it. So that's what so businesses it's, have as their goal. How do I so, make the most money with the least effort? Yeah. So it, it, so if, if you see people using welfare and if you criticize them for abusing the system, they're not. They're doing exactly what the system wanted. If 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 you could have a welfare system and no one ever took a dime of it, then we wouldn't complain about the welfare system because it wouldn't have any effect. But of course we complain about these laws because they're real laws and they have a real effect. So the problem with patent and copyright law is not that there's abuses. Is that there are natural consequences that were intended by the system. They're just unjust. And, and the examples we give are to they're enable just unlawful behavior. Yeah. Yeah. And so people will say things like, well, the problem with patents is that there's bad patent quality because the examiners aren't paid enough and they don't do a good search. Or that patent trolls that don't even make the product, they sue you and they that shouldn't be. Or that the award was by the jury in this case was just too high. So that every time you point an obviously unjust result, they will say, well, that's not the system that I'm defending. But basically there's nothing left after you point to all these abuses and you say, well, well, everything I point out about the system, the way it works, you agree with me that you're not in favor of that. Like libertarians at least. They'll say, well, I'm in favor of the patent system, but no, I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of that. I'm not in favor of that. And then you say, well, what are you in favor of? And they say, well, I'm not an expert. I'm not a patent lawyer. How would I know? It's like, so <laughs> and not to get not to get religious, but this is, you know, I am not religious. And so this is one of my are this is one of my frustrations with some religious people. They argue for God, but they won't define it, or they define it differently than other theists. And so you can't it's like nailing jello to the wall. You can't and then they won't they won't down. accept any of the the crusades or 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 whatever bad fruit you want to point to. Yeah, or if you say, well, I don't believe that a, a guy with a big white beard up in the sky, they say, well, we don't believe in that. It's like, well, what do you believe? Well, well God's undefinable. It's like, well, then what am I supposed to, <laughs> you know, you know, um, and in fact, I came to my religious views similar to the way I came to my patent views. I was a young Catholic, very hardcore, but I, I was dissatisfied with some of the arguments. So I tried to come up with my own and I finally was unable to do it. So I concluded that, yeah, there's a reason I'm unable to prove this too. <laughs> Not that you're religious on you, but no, this is a religious podcast, so that's I think yeah, I know pe people not enjoy to, talking about that. Not to offend your audience, I should say that. No, I, it's it's fine. I had Walter Block on, and he was a uh, uh, very polite, very very fun to talk to. Um, moving on a little bit, um, well, I guess I I did want to touch on this one thing. It's and I'm not still not even sure the implications of it, but I did find a Bible verse actually that I feel would preclude the existence of intellectual property. Uh, it talks about for every breach of trust, whether it's for an ox, donkey, sheep, cloak, or for any kind of lost thing of which one says, this is it, or here it is, the case of both parties shall come before God, and the one who God condemns shall pay double to his neighbor. So it seems like that verse would kind of preclude the existence of uh, immaterial property or being able to sue somebody for theft 
for something that you can't like literally hold in your hand and say, look, here it is, or this is it. Oh, that's interesting. I'll have to look that up. Uh, I, I think I've heard of some other uh, verses in the Bible. Some people have told me um, is, are similar, but I, I, I've, I've forgotten what they were. Um, uh, by the way, there was crude forms of intellectual property even before the Bible, uh, like I think as far back as 500 uh, BC or so in the Greek city-state of Sybaris, there was a culinary competition. So they would have a competition to see who came up with the best uh, dish that year. And whoever won, uh, whatever the, the equivalent of the king was would in that city-state, would give the winner uh, the exclusive right to make that dish for a year. So this, this way of thinking has been around for a long time. The idea that if you know, you'll hear little girls do this too, or, or, or young people, like uh, one girl will wear her hair in a certain way to school one day. And other, if it's popular, other girls start copying her. She says they stole my haircut or something. You know, it's just it's childish, right? It literally is childish, <laughs> but that's infected even what the way adults think about about ideas now. So you mentioned that uh, you're sort of you were sort of begrudgingly dubbed the Austrian expert in terms of intellectual property. It, is that what what other subjects have you moved on to, or, or you find more interesting these um, days? I wouldn't say begrudgingly. I don't. I don't mind at all. Um, I, I. I. am a libertarian, and I like or to make. It a wasn't. It wouldn't have been your first choice, in other words. Well, it's not my main interest. My. Uh, uh, my main interest, uh, even still to a degree, is rights theory, like trying to explain what what rights are, and and how to justify uh, our rights, and how to justify the libertarian conception of rights and the non-aggression principle. Um, but the more I've thought about the IP issue, I realized that that's so strongly tied up with property, like. With property rights, because all so all rights are human rights. Like rocks don't have rights, and mosquitoes don't have rights, um, and all human rights are property rights because rights are the exclusive right to control a scarce means of action or a scarce resource. Um, and you can see this if you think about the uh, the concept of rights is bound up with enforceability. Like a right is thought of as being enforceable. But the word force right there is a physical thing, right? Physical force means how we apply physical control over what? Physical things. I mean, you can't use force on an idea, right? So all rights are enforceable, and they're all applicable to the scarce resources that we can, as human actors, that we can control. So, um, and I've written a lot on contract theory, which I think is a, a related to property theory, um, and on various legal topics that are sort of consequences or applications of that, um, like legislation and and how legislation is not law, um, where law is really sort of a concrete principle that's developed over time in an attempt to find um, a just result in a case of a conflict over a scarce resource. Um, and uh, ca causality too, like causation theory, like how do you know who's responsible for a harm? Uh, is it just the person or what about collective action, like two or more people acting in concert to perform, to perform harm or, or a boss compared to an underling? Like there's always the issue of, you know, um, d d d d when, assuming that the bombing of, of Nagasaki and Hiroshima were, were basically unlibertarian, unjust war crimes. Um, who's responsible? Is it the guy that built the bomb? Is it the guy that flew the plane? Is it the bomber who opened the hatch? Or is it Truman who ordered, the, ordered it to be dropped? Some libertarians have this sort of um, um, rationalistic, legalistic view, which I think is not contextual, which says that basically Truman is not responsible but unless he's coercing someone to do it. I think Walter Block has this view, and he and I have disagreed on this and debated on this. Uh, I think it's a more contextual, holistic thing. I think, of course, Truman is guilty, and so is the bomber. And I think Truman is actually more guilty, right? I think it's a it's a, it's a hierarchical system that has an effect in the real world. Um, I mean, there's a there's a joke among some libertarians. It's like, uh, um, uh, Hitler was put on trial after World War II for the, for the for war crimes, and the prosecutor said, you know. You, you, you've called you've caused the deaths of millions of people and all this destruction and human death and misery and suffering. What do you have to say for yourself? And he says, I only, I just gave orders. <laughs> you know, but of course that's a joke because we see that as, as absurd. But 
that would be the implication of some of these libertarian views that like only the direct actor is liable. I think that they think that because they have a mistaken understanding of the concept of joint and several liability because they're not lawyers and they don't understand uh, creative ways that the law has handled situations like that. So I think that they're afraid that if like the mafia boss who gives an order to a hitman to kill someone, if the boss is held responsible for giving an order, then there's like 100 percent responsibility. And you're allocating it to him, and there's none left over for the hitman. So they're worried that, like, if you if you hold the the boss who gives an order responsible, that you can't hold the the guy lower down the pole responsible. But of course, the answer is they're both responsible. You can have joint and several liability. Just like if two guys beat you up, they're both 100% responsible for all the damage that you suffered. You know, if two people two people collaborate to blow up a, a building and kill a bunch of people they're both 100% liable each for the murder for the murders of those people this is easily handled in the law by this concept concept of joint and several liability so i've written on things like that and in fact i have a book coming out uh, soon called law in the libertarian world which collects a lot of my uh, edited essays and, and articles on intellectual property and these topics. Uh, so IP will just be like one, I don't know, one tenth of kind of the, the scope of the things that I've covered in my, in my writing. Well, and it also seems like um, just in terms of the way that the economics work out, any, if let's say, uh, well, like the consequences of, you know, exterminating 6 million people sort of falls back onto the entire German people or the entire German nation. You have the loss of all of those lives. Now you've got this many less workers, and that's going to right. have economic and monetary penalties. And now you're not going to now uh, things goods are certain goods are going to cost more based on how many of those people were farmers. And it just ripples out into the entire economy, it affects the price and ease of doing anything and everything. Yeah, there's consequential damages. I mean, in, in IP, this comes up when people say, "Well, how can you say that?" Um, there's no property right in ideas because ideas make things more valuable. So, for example, if I have a, a blank sheet of paper and someone a, a blank a blank notebook and someone steals it, it doesn't harm me as much as if they steal my notebook with my novel on it, which is unpublished, let's say. So they say, well, that proves because the, the the one with the words on it is more valuable. That proves that the words have value, and therefore you have a property right in them. See, that's sort of their argument. But again, this can be handled simply with with just well-developed established principles of law, which is that when you commit a tort, which is an offense or a trespass, um, that's the crime, but then you measure the amount of damages that is done by the consequences to the person. So if I steal your Rembrandt painting, it hurts you more than if I steal your poster, even though they're both materially you know, pieces of paper with, with ink on them. right? Mm -hmm. um, that's just common sense. Um, you know, if I if I steal your grandfather's watch from World War One, it's worse than if I steal a watch that you just bought for the same price. Would that bleed over into things like uh, wireless frequencies for TV bands? Like if somebody's making money off of subscribers that depend on clear airwaves, and then somebody comes along and disrupts that, and somebody knows exactly who they did and. Uh, they had to pay so much in damages to angry customers and things like that. How would that relate? I think you've hit on – so you've hit on one of the few difficult areas of libertarianism that I would say is not yet settled. Um, I think the IP issue is settled. In other words, it's such a clear case. Like to my mind, of all the issues of libertarianism, the drug war and intellectual property are the two easiest. <laughs> it may be hard to see the IP, one, but once you see it, it's just – there is no good argument for IP, and there's no good argument for the drug war. You could have an argument for taxation or for war even. right? I don't agree with them, but you can understand the arguments for them. It's not, those are not as easy, uh, or even for public schooling or even for a central bank, but you, there's just no argument for drug war or IP. Um, now, as far as what you're talking about is spectrum rights. So the question there is how do we apply standard private law principles of original appropriation or homesteading is what we call it, which – Obviously, it easily applies to tangible material things like land, like land. Mm -hmm. um, or your own body or things like that. How do we apply it to um, 
to airwaves, basically, or the spectrum, the electromagnetic spectrum. Because um, on the one hand, you can make an argument that, like intellectual property, uh, it's immaterial, and so there's no property right in it. But you could make the other argument, which I think you're getting at. Um, I lean towards, and I've written on this in a tentative way, I lean towards the idea that you can homestead a radio spectrum analogously to the way that you can homestead shipping lanes on the ocean or airways in, in the sky. Like if you have an airline that regularly flies over an area, um, you've homesteaded certain things about that. Like you can keep flying over there. And if someone, like if you have an airport and someone builds near you, then they can't complain that the noise from the airplanes taking off and the risk is a nuisance. Because you were already your, there. You're, and you're coming making to the, money and yeah. serving customers. You're coming to the nuisance, which is another way of saying that uh, by building there and by doing this activity first, they've sort of homesteaded a property right, which is not a uh, it's not a the standard type of property right like in land, which you could think of as full or a lodial property. You can think of it as an easement, it's a right of way. Uh, anyway, so property can be complex, and the law can handle it. The more esoteric it gets, the more difficult it is, and it, it takes longer for the legal system to develop and find solutions, but eventually we do. So I think that in the case of radio waves, you can look at it as um, – so for example, if I'm broadcasting a signal, I, what I'm doing is I'm perturbing the electromagnetic spectrum for an infinite distance around, but it peters out exponentially over time. But you know, I'm perturbing the EM spectrum. So – in a, in a sense, you could argue in a trivial way I'm committing trespass against everyone because like I'm shaking the electrons in your body when I do that. <laughs> but we would say it's not trespass because it's not interfering with your ability to control your body, right? Whereas causing if I – harm or damages of any kind. Well, but if I shoot a laser into your body, I am, right? But if it's just a, a radio signal, it's just, it passes through people harmlessly. So that's not a trespass. On the other hand, if you were to set up a receiver in your house and receive these radios, like let's suppose I'm using a walkie-talkie and I'm sending a signal, what I want it to be a private communication to you, but it passes through my neighbor's property and he picks up an antenna and he picks it up. Under copyright ideas, that's a violation of my copyright because I own that information or something. So I think we can abolish copyright and say that's not the issue. So I don't think that receiving a signal someone sends is a violation of their rights. However, if I broadcast a competing signal on the same wave, wave band, which, which impedes their ability to transmit this signal. So let's say I'm sending a, I have a radio station on, I don't know, I forgot the, free, the, the, wave, the wave bands are for AM. I haven't listened to so long, like 1980 megahertz or whatever it is, and that, that narrow wave band. And I've, I'm, I'm sending that for 10 miles around, and everyone's listening. You could, you could view that as analogous to. Uh, the shipping lanes or the way airplanes go, and I've homesteaded that right to to use this empty sort of air airwave space to send signals. People can listen in if they want. I can't blame them for that. But if they generate their own signal on the same one that interferes with mine, you could say that's a type of trespass. I don't think that's 100 percent settled. That's the way I would lean. That's the way the common law was going before the the federal government interfered and shortcut it with the FCC in the 1930s. So they 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 short circuited the the natural development of the common law to apply to this new new situation, and I think it would have developed along those lines. There are a couple of IP pests that argue that if you accept that you could have a right to broadcast over a spectrum, this also implies intellectual property rights. I don't think they're correct. I think you can have one without the other. But even if they're correct, all that means is you can't have spectrum rights because IP is clearly wrong. It seems like it would be a, an analogy, and I've heard people talk about this before in like different uh, talks I've heard about how to do interpersonal arbitration between neighbors about noise levels and things like that. So I think that, that would sense, handle. I think that would handle the nuisance case, but I don't know how easy it would be to handle the uh, uh, the right to broadcast on a frequency for a long space to serve customers or listeners. Right. Yeah. Because in the example that I'm thinking of, it was about a dog barking. And it was like, oh, well, it's, it's bothering me. Uh, so I guess in, this, in, let's say you had somebody who was listening to a local broadcast, but then you had somebody move in and start broadcasting. And now all of a sudden, vital information that was valuable to this person is now being lost by somebody that comes in afterwards. Or maybe they were both there all along, and then this person just decides to start using it. Um, but yeah, I was, I'll have to think I, about I would, that in I terms would, of like would... dog barking. In, in your case, I would tend to think that 
that uh, it's the right of the transmitter or the broadcaster that's being infringed, not the right of the listener. The listener has no right to receive anything. Um, um, it, it's, it's just really the right of the broadcaster, which is almost what the same they thing. they were paying because, to, for a certain service, like paying for satellite radio and then somebody else comes in and I'm, uh, satellite radio might not be a great example. No, I, I still They're think that for some that, other kind of radio service, and then well, yeah, you could you could you could have an encrypted, a digitally encrypted uh, uh, television signal, let's say, um, and and you can receive that signal, and then they give you the key to unlock it, so you can watch it, and you're paying a fee for that. But still, I think that 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 fee you're paying is just a private contract between you and the broadcaster. Um, the broadcaster himself is the one that has the right to the to the airwaves because he's the one using it by transmitting over it. He's the one actively using it. Well, I'm um, saying what if then somebody comes in and starts interfering? So I guess yeah. their offense would be more it, against the, the person broadcaster. broadcasting than the that, receiver. Yeah. I think that's how I would look at it. Okay. Well, that, that, uh, that time went by pretty quick. We're over an hour already. <laughs> so if you want to um, plug your stuff, what's your website? And you have a podcast as well. Where can people go to read your books or listen to more? Um, my libertarian stuff is at stephankinsella.com, and my I, I have all my IP related stuff on c4sif.org, which is center the, the letter four c4sif.org, which stands for Center for the Study of Innovative Freedom. And my podcast is really just a collection of when I do other people's podcasts like this one. So it's just this is a feed to assemble all those. That's mostly what it is, but that's on my website stephankinsella.com. And how could people? How could somebody reach out to you? Uh, there, or I'm on Twitter and Facebook at, at NS Kinsella. NS Kinsella is my handle on Twitter and Facebook. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Stefan and, uh, or Steven. And uh, let's do it again sometime. I'd be happy to. Thanks, Adam. All right. Thank you.